was so great to hear the really rich diversity of experiences and expertise that we have in this group. And we definitely had that feeling with the last workshop as well. And one thing I, I really want to stress, and Louise has already mentioned it, but certainly uh, a prior involvement in the feminist judgment methodology is no requirement to being part of this project, although it's wonderful that there are people that do have that experience. And the different levels of familiar, familiarity with the feminist judgment methodology is really you know, one of the reasons that we wanted to have this workshop to begin to introduce the methodology. And I can already tell that we're really going to benefit from having such a, a great and rich, diverse group of contributors. So by way of, of context, what we've got really here in terms of the feminist judgment methodology, which is something that begins in the domestic sphere with the Canadian um, Women's Court and has really grown from there. And it's this idea of reimagining judgment from a feminist perspective. And since uh, the Canadian approach in 2008, we've had um, projects from all over the world, from the United Kingdom, uh, from Australia, from the United States, uh, from Africa, from New Zealand, from Ireland, Northern Ireland, um, and even different jurisdictions in terms of particular legal perspectives. And of course, the international project, uh, which Louise mentioned, and, and certainly the international project uh, was the, the first to look in the international realm, but in terms of the ICC, um, it only received minimal treatment. So we see a real place for our, our book. Um, and there's been a, a reference sometimes to the fact that a cottage industry has grown around the idea of feminist judgment writing. But each of these projects, we wanna be really clear here that in many ways we, we seek to learn from uh, those projects. And one of the things that um, our team has done is interviewed some editors or people who were contributors in previous projects, because we really wanna build upon um, that expertise. And we really want to interrogate what's possible within the feminist judgment methodology. And certainly the different projects in many ways reflect questions of space, time, temporality, colonial history, in that they really reflect the jurisdictions from which they come. But there are a number of hallmarks of the projects in the sense of feminist judgment writing is a bit different to normal academic critique because you are actually producing uh, a judgment or a part thereof of a judgment that um, reads as legally plausible. And so that's one of the questions that I'm going to explore in this part today. I'm going to introduce you to two people who very generously agreed to be interviewed, Professor Heather Douglas, uh, who was involved in the Australian Feminist Judgment Project, and also the very soon to be released Indigenous Judgment Project, and also Dr Catherine O'Rourke, who is a contributor to and involved in putting together the Irish, Northern Irish Project. And two things really come out of those interviews. Uh, really asking a question about what counts as feminist judgment writing, what are some of those uh, requirements or criteria? And also on one hand, we have the idea of what counts as feminist judgment writing in the sense of a critique of, of law, particularly the masculinist foundations of law. But on the other hand, it still has to read as a plausible legal judgment. So there's a tension there that is a tension that feminist theorists have been grappling with uh, in terms of how we respond to law and how we intervene in law. And so these interviews, I hope, are a useful entree into that question that we're seeking to really interrogate in the project. And Heather, I was wondering to start us off, if you could talk about your background as to being involved in these rewriting or reimagining judgment projects. Sure. So um, I started off as a lawyer working um, first in private practice and then in the Aboriginal Legal Service in Alice Springs for a few years. And then I turned up in Brisbane um, and got a job at Griffith University to run a pre-law program for Aboriginal people for about five years, but gradually sort of segued into mainstream legal academia. And um, in that context, really, my interests were marginalisation, really, and how people were left out of the law. So women, Indigenous people, people with disabilities, and that's kind of the work that I've done within the frame of criminal law, largely. Thinking about 
the art and craft of judgment writing. And I think that's one of the really interesting features of these projects is that it's not always, but it's usually academics who are rewriting or reimagining judgments. And academic, as academics, we don't write judgments. Uh, mm. As you say, we're a source mm. of critique of judgments. How, how did the contributors grapple with some of those difficulties in terms of wearing the, the judicial robes, imagining themselves as judges and writing something that read as a legal judgment and was plausible as a legal judgment? Uh, so we, we had a bit of a systematic approach to the writing process, which we assisted people with. So we had a workshop, uh, we, we ran workshops in several states and we had a workshop, the initial workshop with judges and judges gave, gave tips to the people involved in the workshops about the issues they might face. So finding your voice, um, telling the story of the participants, putting the story before the process. Uh, a whole range of sort of tips that those judges used in terms of um, writing judgments, things like knowing who you are, knowing what your biases are and being upfront to yourself about your biases so you can deal with them properly in the judgment so that, you know, you, you're thinking about the facts, knowing what your biases are. So a lot of those kinds of things were talked about by uh, actual practising judges in our early um, workshops. And then in the second workshop, people came back with drafts and we had more judges critiquing and reality testing our drafts. And the reason we did that was because our project was trying to be real, you know, real alternatives to the judgments. So we wanted them to be legally real and to abide by the rules of the time and so on. So this reality testing by current judges, I think, was really helpful. But I do think a lot of people struggle to write judgments as a, in the form, as the particular form. And um, uh, I recently wrote a judgment for the Indigenous Judgment Project with another scholar called Heron Loban. And I was mindful of someone, Jenny Nielsen, in the Feminist Judgments Project, who said she started writing the judgment by using the text in the actual judgment and rewriting that, stri striking out things and filling them in with different words and things before she realised that actually she had to throw that judgment out and think about the facts and rewrite the judgment from scratch and then edit the judgment into judicial speak rather than just play around with an existing draft that someone else had written to try to make it feminist. So I thought that was a really good tip because, of course, that's what judges do. They don't rewrite someone else's judgment. They write their own judgment. And um, so that was really important. And also I think dropping the idea that you had to actually decide differently, that you had to make a different decision, that, that a lot of the problems with the judgments we're unhappy with are not necessarily the decision in terms of the decision's effect on a whole range of potential cases, but the way they're written, the way they talk about women, the way they talk about assumptions and so on. So I think when people dropped the idea that they actually had to have a different result, um, that was really helpful as well because then they could focus on how they said things and they could write through to a decision, which was another tip that the judges gave us at the workshops is that you have a problem and you write through to the decision and you use the law and you get to a decision. And the decision might not be what you've expected when you started out, but you write towards that decision. And so uh, and it's the way you write as a feminist that can be the difference here rather than the actual result. So, and the, and the resources you use to get to that decision as well and obviously Adrian Howe's example of precedent but also others examples um, like Beth Gaze for example in in um, her particular case that she wrote about employment of teachers she used different resources to sort of underpin her argument so those things can so different kinds of reading speeches or research that is available that has been discussed and so on so you know, what you use on your way to your end point might be really important as well and might show up different assumptions, use different language, put the woman who's involved in the case in a different light, for example. So I think all of those things were really important tips from the judges. I really felt that they were very helpful in terms of setting us on, on the path. One thing that I'm interested in, in hearing about from your perspective as a contributor, so I understand that uh, you rewrote the judgment uh, in rewrite. Uh, yeah. And I think that one of the things about writing uh, judgments is that stepping into the judicial role and actually having to write something that resembles a legal judgment and is plausible as a judgment 
and also reads as feminist that's a that's a pretty big ask how did you confront that task yeah you, you know you're right and it, it does sometimes feel in tension because you know obviously I think the, you know, the contribution of the feminist children project is that we imagine a different kind of legal universe a different way to interpret um, um a different way to determine you know relevant facts and to contextualize judgments and, and then to um, interpret and apply the law um, but uh, we also hope that we'll be read by our kind of legal colleagues and be taught and yeah so it can be intention so I think well I suppose maybe to start with the first piece about the judgment writing because in lots of ways um, I was very accustomed to doing feminist legal work I was much less accustomed to writing judgments um, one of the things that was helpfully done quite early on, and actually this was before the Northern Irish Feminist Judgment Project, I went to one of the teaching workshops from the coming out of the English Welsh project. And one of the things that they really emphasized in that was trying to demystify a little bit judgment writing. And they said, look, you know, essentially, you know, you've got a, you're, you're condensing the facts, right? You're identifying the relevant facts, you're telling, so you're sort of telling a story, and then you're, um, contextualizing those facts and uh you're you know you do lots of things that actually are familiar to you um so there was a real emphasis on trying to demystify that a little bit and i found that helpful and actually i worked pretty closely with the framework of the original judgment when coming up with my own um because that those were useful guardrails i think for the for the project for me but then as i went on um i didn't know going in really whether i was actually going to change the outcome um i was fair but i was very keen that the judge would be differently framed you know um but that ultimately actually i think i really kind of grew into the judge the, to uh, my judicial role and really sort of started to have fun with it and um as academics we're so careful about you know we double and triple cite everything we're so careful about showing our evidence base and our rigor and our supporting um uh, supporting evidence for our claims but judges just get to stay, say stuff, you know, it's just that it's just sort of remarkable. It's such a different way of writing. And I just ultimately I ended up actually quite dramatically reversing the judgment. I came to entirely different conclusions. Um, and it was part of the process of growing into the role of being the judge that really kind of allowed me to do that. But I just said, well, look, um, here's here's me applying my judicial common sense uh, to, to this set of facts and to this scenario. So. Um, yeah, so I think the process was quite important. I'll say it was it was it was a process and a useful one. Um, and then as to the to the feminist part of it, I mean, I did you know obviously with the drafting workshops. So we had initial workshops before we even got into the drafting workshops, and a lot of those were about the, the method and methodology. And we had lots of lots of generous input from the folks who had done the work before, uh, particularly you know Rosemary Hunter and Claire McLean and Erica Rackley. They were very supportive and very practically helpful to us. Um, and uh, the yeah, the, that's the key thing. So I mean, I I I applied the method, you know. I um, so in terms of the facts, I mean, actually trying to tell the story a bit more of the applicant uh, was an was a first thing I did because obviously in the in the initial judgments, you know, there's this kind of one sentence, you know, the nationalist resident of the Garvahi Road. So actually, what I tried to do a little bit in my judgment was to tell the story of what it meant to be a woman living on the Gavahi Road when parades were happening, because that's completely um, overlooked or not, 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 not detailed at all. Um, and then I think the main thing, though, I did was, was about how you contextualize the, the facts and drawing on, uh, particularly drawing on other disciplines. So I went back and did, so my judgment was about the regulation of, of parading in Northern Ireland and um, a challenge to the fact that no women had been appointed to the, to the parades commission um, that oversees parading, and in that in the in, in the original judgment, uh, the you know the judge is very dismissive of the application and says you know we all know that parading in Northern Ireland is about ethnic identity and you know, um, so it, I mean it wasn't a hard judgment to rewrite in that sense. But what I did do was go back and actually look at the history of parading in Northern Ireland, and I drew out the fact that uh, there's pretty there's pretty good historic documentation of the fact that there was you know it's always been lots of women in Northern Irish parading, also women who self organised within both within ethnic groups, but also the fact that as parading had evolved in Northern Ireland, um, increasingly parading wasn't necessarily about ethnic issues; it was trade union movements. Again, lots of women in them, Women's Day marches. Um, even now, actually, our largest parade is Pride. Um, 
So drawing on that, I found that sort of going back, kind of giving that kind of historical context, um, which of course the, judge, the original judge paid no attention to and um, being quite useful. Um, and then, yeah, and then I think challenging the, the judicial common sense of the original judgment and that sort of judicial common sense that, you know, we all know that uh, parading is about um, ethnic identity. And so that's so the obligation to be representative of the community refers to the two ethnic communities. Um, actually, just in light of having told the story of the applicant, contextualizing the parading in a different way, then led me to a very different sort of judicial common sense around what representation mattered when it came to constituting our, our parades commission. Um, I wanted to just put a spotlight or an emphasis on some of the things that I thought were significant to come out of those interviews and just more generally about the feminist judgment writing methodology um, and particularly for those who are a bit, a bit um, newer to the methodology. So one of the things that I think is really significant is that feminist judgment writing isn't deciding for women. Um, it's, it's more complex and nuanced than that in that in many instances in other projects, the actual outcome of a decision hasn't necessarily changed. In, in some cases, indeed, it very much has changed, but it's, it's a bigger picture in terms of how we um, appreciate the, the gendered nature of law, how we frame narratives, how stories are told. And in this respect, I think Rosemary Hunter's uh, checklist, um, and which was never supposed to be a definitive checklist, but I think it provides really useful, a really useful framework in terms of thinking about what counts as feminist judgment writing. And some of the things that she includes in her list are asking the woman question, including women and their experiences, challenging gender bias, contextualizing and particular what you see in a lot of feminist judgment rewrites is a really different framing of the facts. Framing the facts in a way that isn't necessarily that um, judicial, old fashioned common sense of um, actually giving, and I mean, mean there's no common sense in it, giving no context to a person's particular lived experience. Um, also, using feminist scholarship um, and being seeking remedies um, to injustice and improving the conditions of women's lives, promoting substantive equality, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's important to emphasize here that there's no one linear way of doing feminist judgment writing. And that's why for us, it was so important to bring together contributors from all over the world uh, with a range of different experiences so we can be um, true to our um, intersectional aims and to think and interrogate some of the, the tensions that exist in terms of the feminist judgment writing methodology that there isn't necessarily one feminist read of a particular issue so there will be different approaches.